Kenyan gamblers will pay a fifth or 20% of the cash they've set aside in their wallets for betting in a proposed tax aimed at curbing the practice. Treasury Cabinet Secretary Ukur Yatani has proposed to heavily tax punters by raising the excise duty on cash wagered on betting, gaming, prize competitions, and buying a lottery ticket from the current 7.5%. If approved by MPs, betting firms will be required to withhold and forward 200 out of every 1,000 shillings wagered, regardless of whether the punter wins or loses their bets. The cost of renting space in Kenyan malls and offices has dropped. Listed property investor Ilam Fahari, iReits, which is a real estate investment trust, says office rent in top-grade buildings has dropped by an average of 16.9% over the past four years on increased supply. This has left malls and office landlords with subdued earnings. Joining us from Nairobi to discuss further is Kevin Ingige, who's an equity and fixed income trading analyst with Genghis Investment Bank. A good afternoon to you, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Starting with real estate, what's the reason for the drop in rents that we've seen in the property market? Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, so the recent space we've seen around the city, especially around the capital, and those are areas of Westlands and Upper Hill, uh, have really we've really seen uh, skyrocketing uh, buildings coming up, mixed uh, mixed use developments, you know, rentals, office space, all kinds of uh, you name it all. So there's been a glut, of course, thanks to the pandemic, where now people were forced to work from home, and the demand for office space was not as as, as exciting anymore. So those are sort of a different uh, dynamics. And uh, guys realized that, okay, with a stable internet connection, we don't really need as much office space. So most companies and SMEs really cut down on, on office space. You couple that with uh, additional that we have all these uh, private uh, PPPs developments coming up where government is giving up land and the Chinese or wealthy developers are putting up space. We have anchor tenants. These are the large retail stores. Uh, we have South Africa and, uh, and Botswana, that's Choppies and ShopRite that exited the Kenyan space. And these are the, uh, traditionally, these are the uh, clients that uh, bring in most of the other clientele that uh, we call them the food storages. So a, a couple of, you know, uh, too much supply, uh, demand has really fallen and anchor tenants exiting the Kenyan space due to uh, different dynamics has really contributed to uh, this pr- uh, price plunge. Thank you so much for that. So, so landlords are losing revenue, but surely this is good news for business owners who are seeking reduced operating costs? Well, it is. It is. It, it, it depends on how you look at it. As, as a nice me or a small business or, 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 a, or a tenant, an occupier, if you may call them that, uh, it's good news for you as you bring down your operating costs. But on the flip side to that, you, we look at... Uh, these buildings are, you know, they're supporting many other businesses. Like I mentioned, when you have an anchor tenant like a South African or Botswana brand, say Choppies or ShopRite, for instance, most of the other small SMEs are really, uh, really get traffic due to these anchor tenants who need to uh, pass by the evening to do their shopping, who need to come and do, uh, you know, shopping for their clothes, their groceries and all that stuff. So once these anchor tenants exit, we've, we've seen over the last two, three, four years that most of the other small businesses also exit that space. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a flip side of a coin depends on which side you're looking at it but ultimately it hurts it hurts the economy more uh than it, it supports it gotcha so what does it say about the i guess the covid recovery for the property market since it was assumed that there'd be a surge or at least a, a recovery with more people renting yeah so there was this expectation that you know businesses were booming the country has fully been locked uh, uh unlocked uh, rather uh as you can see we're not now wearing masks the masks policy has been uh, pulled off so uh, there was the expectation that, you know, in 2022 or towards the end of 2021, going into 2022, at least in the midterm, uh, we were going to see businesses resume uh, operations back to normal. We've seen them, so that in some industries. Some industries continue to, uh, to suffer. Agriculture is one of them. We have droughts, uh, you know, guys uh, uh, shifting strategies from uh, crop cultivation to now uh, other land use like putting up apartment and rental homes. So this is really hit us. Hospitality industry is around 78% uh, on the recovery program. But then even the ones that fully recovered, you know, like the transport sector, the education sector, most of the services sector are now being grappled with issues uh, that are to do with uh, them coming to the general election. So we have an, a new a new type of election where yeah, the incumbent now has finished their term, they cannot rerun. But uh, uh, how citizens are looking at it is the incumbent has, you know, chosen their horse that they're going to uh, spearhead towards the election. So 
I mean, it's 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 quite an uncertain election, if I may say. I think it brings us back to the 2007, 2008 kind of election, and um, I think most of these, you know, FDS, most of these businesses, banks are not lending as much, at least for now, and this is really, really uh, hitting the economy. And uh, thank you for that, Kevin. So, can the low rates, at least low rent environment, be sustained for the rest of this year and beyond? How do you see that playing out? I see that being sustained. I mean, the the landlords here, it's a buyer's market, so the occupiers dictate what kind uh, of rents they're going to pay and as i mentioned a couple of uh, i even foresee them going lower not just being sustained as uh, you know most of these small businesses smes that really operate on uh, banks lendings uh, for their operating cash flow are really going to suffer and some might might actually end up closing down in terms of employment we've not really seen uh, most of the firms are hiring back to their pre-pandemic level. So most of the guys are still at home looking for jobs. The government is on a hiring freeze. You know, we have all these uh, twin deficits. So I suspect these rates at the best will remain uh, uh, sustained at where they are. And uh, I mean, the most likely and worst case scenario is you're going to see this going uh, going down as more apartments, more, more office blocks are, are really coming up in the city. Very interesting. All right, from, from real estate to uh, taxes on gambling, what do you make of the proposed raising of the excise duty on cash wagered on bets? I foresee MPs really uh, uh, fighting this, yeah? You know, it's an election year, MPs are seeking for votes. I don't think uh, this is the time you want to go and tell people that, you know, uh, we are going to slap you more. We, I just looked at the numbers and uh, Kenya had uh, uh, just through one of the mobile telco, the biggest telco that operates, I think, 95% of their, all the flows to the betting industry, uh, said the uh, amount wage that had doubled from around 49 billion Kenya shillings to 84 billion Kenya shillings. So that tells you, even with the 7.5, uh, negotiated uh, excess tax. Uh, Kenyans are still betting and uh, I mean, gambling more and more. So I don't foresee uh, uh, MPs uh, uh, pro, uh, passing this. Of course, this comes with other sin taxes, uh, like the excess increases on, you know, water, uh, confectionery, sugar confectionery, you know, uh, white chocolate, and etc. Beers, wines, uh, you name it. So I don't really see uh, uh, parliamentarians passing this. I know they're going for a recess on June. I think it's around seven or nine. So they roughly have one and a half month, uh, one and a half months to either pass this or, or or put it for debate till after the election. So uh, for now, I don't, I really don't foresee them passing this, and I think it might be it might uh, uh, be maintained at seven point five where it is right now. All right, okay, thanks. That. But I do want to touch on one more thing. There's a quote from uh, Treasury Cabinet Secretary Ukor Yatani. He said that gambling is extremely addictive and can result in a variety of harmful reper repercussions, especially for the youth. So is it about morality or raising revenue or both? I, I, would, I would really be surprised. I, I, think, he, I think he's outrightly lying to, 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 the, to the citizens <laughs> in Kenya. I mean, it's not about morality. We've seen uh, this government has really been struggling with, uh, uh, with deficits. Uh, we've looked at, we are now borrowing just to, to repay recurrent expenditure, you know, government wages. Most of the cash, uh, again, has been now diverted to, you know, we have an election, as I mentioned, in three months. So it's wherever we can get that extra coin, we are going to get it from. And there are only a couple of uh, areas they can, they can get these revenues from. And those are what they call the sin taxes or morality taxes. Because the government is not really increasing uh, 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 the, the, the quality of life for its citizens. They're not both uh, you know, the business environment, the business sentiment right here, especially in the capital, is really subdued. Our peers and neighbors just around the east, like Rwanda, are really beating us on, on, on the best countries to, you know, to start a business on. So I, I really doubt it's about morality and it's about bringing in that 55 billion Kenya shillings just to, you know, to sort of patch up those uh, budget deficits. Thanks. Uh, still on taxes, what do you make of the Kenya Revenue Authority getting expanded or seeking to get expanded powers to freeze more assets beyond land? So the two ways they look at the Kenya Revenue Authority, they are now rebranding to the Kenya Revenue Service, and there was a joke about that all over Twitter. They are calling them the KRS-1. So uh, one of the government agencies that has really uh, shined, if you look at all government ag agencies and parastatals, has become the Kenya Revenue Service. They've been hitting their budget, uh, I think, over the last three to four years, including during the pandemic. Uh, only in 20, I think around 2019, 2019 is when they missed by a small margin hitting their budget. So Kenya Revenue Authority has been doing the right things, but now on the flip side to that is they've really been killing businesses one uh, the second biggest beer manufacturer called keroche has really ha so their factories shut for around three to four months you know with beer inventories that uh, was almost going bad in the next 30 days due to a tax uh, tax dispute so Kerry is doing some of the right things, but then again, the approach towards businesses uh, and SMEs especially has really uh, not been to the benefits of Kenyans. We've seen 
uh, co companies laying off guys until they sort these tax disputes. So uh, again, it's more or less about bridge, bridging and bridging and bridging those budget deficits. And they, I think the only way they see of doing this is uh, through the Kenya Revenue Service. And that's why we've seen them increasing all these uh, uh, excess and taxable uh, uh, duties and fees, including on things like exogenous things like uh, prices of oil. So I don't see uh, I don't see much that will be raised from that, of course. Again, these are the guys who are supporting these elections. These are the guys supporting the incumbents and uh, the guys running up. So, I mean, this is something that is... Easier said than done for me. Mm, it's it's all the elections seem to loom over anything. But still, on, on that point, I just wanted to follow up. I mean, there, I understand about it said that tax cheats or you know wealthy individuals that are using tax avoidance owe about two hundred and sixty billion shillings to the government. Right. Does that justify this move in any way, in in your view? I, I really, I mean, these are guys, these are not uh, tax uh, deals that we are talking about uh, 12 or 24 month period. These are tax deals that if you follow up, you'll find these are uh, things spanning back down, you know, 10, 15 years. So this KRA knew these guys are there. These guys are protected by uh, powerful individuals up there. And again, even if you say they're going to raise that 200 billion, the deficits we have are crazy and are major. So it's not a one-stop solution. Once they breach that, then what else do you do? I think what the KRA and the government in general needs to focus on is just boosting, uh, you know, boosting the business environment in the country, ensuring that guys are employed, increase the taxable base. What the government is doing is, you know, dwindling and, and, and crushing that taxable base by enforcing all these uh, punitive measures as opposed to uh, looking at it inside out and just boosting and increasing that taxable base and by that we'll be able to bridge our deficit so uh, that's what i said for kra there are things they're doing right uh, there are things i think they're twisted by the government uh, into threatening some people into maybe just going one way or the other during these upcoming elections so i don't really see that going uh, going anywhere to be honest Thanks, Kevin. Finally, about a minute ago, we were talking last night ahead of this interview and you were delayed by traffic. And I was surprised to find that there was still gridlock, which I thought after last week with the agreement between government and oil marketers, that would end. Why is there still fuel queues around uh, Nairobi and other areas? I mean, you're right on that. I was just telling also my friends, and I, 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 if you remember earlier, we mentioned it. A distance of 200 meters, I didn't even need the fuel. I just needed to go and take a turn off. A, a distance of 200 meters took me four hours. Oh, just my to take God. Yes, it was bad. Guys are really queuing on on uh, on the petrol station, and most of our petrol stations are just by the roadside, uh, everywhere around the city, especially. So they close off all the roads, and it just becomes a dead end. It's a gridlock. So yes, the government signed uh, 34.4 billion. They promised again to release these funds to oil marketing corporations within 48 hours. Again, I mean, I think I'm more trustworthy than my government when I, I promise something. That has not been fulfilled yet. So we're still seeing this gridlock. I was out today just a few years ago, and the situation is just the same all over the country. And no oil marketing corporation will come and speak out for fear of being reprimanded by the government. So government insists there's fuel uh, in, the, in, the, in the inventories, but the fuel is not getting to the to the, to the the cit citizens. So I spoke to one uh, OMC uh, insider uh, at a confidence level, and they mentioned that the cash has not been disbursed. And that's just one of the issues. They've not been paid over the last three to four months. The other issue is they are purchasing, they are, they're, they're being forced to sell oil at the cost price, which is around 107 Kenya shillings per liter. So that's not something they're going to do because they're not even going to break even. So those are the two issues really uh, challenging us in the country right now. Kevin Ngigie, uh, Equities Fixed Income Trading Analyst with Genjus Investment Bank. Thank you so much for talking to us about the latest in the Kenyan economy. We appreciate your insights. Thank you so much.